We're going to continue in our series about the Sermon on the Mount. And today's message is called The Law. Which is exactly the response I expected to get. Uh, and I think you'll find it's a lot more exciting as we get through this. But uh, I'm, I, I know this message, this thought will take me at least two weeks to get through. It might take me longer. Uh, and, you know, it's funny because, as we mentioned a moment ago, I'm getting older. And it, it, if you would have told me 10 years ago, for example, that I would be up here enthusiastically preaching verse by verse uh, through the Bible, I would probably say, I think you got the wrong person. It just didn't fit my personality. But the older I get, the more excited I get about speaking and preaching this way. And I, we, many of you filled out a survey from a few weeks ago about the, uh, the deeper content kind of messages. Still working on that. I really appreciate all your feedback. Uh, if you liked the message I did about Bible translations, which was a deep dive, just a lot of information, no anecdotes or statistics and stuff like that, or not much, you're going to like this message today because this is in that lane. I have so much content to get through. I'm going to stick pretty close to my notes, and I, I hope you appreciate it because uh, we are going to study God's Word today. Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, so uh, this is one of the most interesting and tricky passages in the Sermon on the Mount. So let me kind of catch you up to the context. We're we're like 15 or 16 verses into our fifth week. (laughs) We're going super fast. Uh, And so let me catch you up on the context. So Jesus started the Sermon on the Mount listing off the Beatitudes and basically turned the idea of what it means to be blessed upside down. Then he tells us that persecution is a good thing and we should be really super excited when it happens because it means we have a great reward in heaven. Then he goes on into this analogy about how what we do matters, that our behavior and our choices are very important. And he goes into this, we studied this idea of salt and light and, and learned that Jesus was talking about the usefulness of what we do, or in other words, our works, our choices and behaviors. Then he jumps into this talk about the law. And what's crazy is you can tell from the context that the people are excited about the idea of getting rid of the law or flaunting the law. And uh, and I think that's where most of us are. Most of the people that will hear this message are kind of in that same lane of thinking that, yeah, that law, that's a bad thing that we're not subject to. That was for other people, and I'm glad about it. Uh, We are excited about hearing how we are no longer subject to the law. And I think there's probably a few people, maybe one or two, that will be hearing this message or hear this preface, and they'll be like, yes, finally you're going to start preaching about the law like you should have been doing all along. And uh, and they'll say we're still under the law. Well, we're going to study it. We're not going to worry about what Jeremy says. Can I get an amen? We're going to look at what Jesus says because what Jesus says is a lot more important than what I say. You can take what I say, toss it out the window, throw it away, but you ought to pay careful attention to what Jesus says. Are you with me? Okay, so uh, I already said a lot of that, so let's move on. So we're going to, there's a lot of content to get through. And next week is the 4th of July, and I mean, you can already see, we've got a, a, a pretty big dip in our attendance right now because people are camping, it's summertime, kids are at camp, and uh, I get it. Next week, <laughs> it might just be a few of us here because it's the 4th of July, but I really want to challenge you. If you're going away, and you're on vacation, and you're camping, God bless you, and I hope you have an incredible time celebrating this great nation. But if you're just at home, don't use that as, a, as an excuse to, to vacate from the Word of God. Celebrate the freedom. Understand this, that the freedom you have to assemble here like we're doing today is not something that you should take for granted, and you should celebrate your day of independence by being in church, studying the Word of God. Can I get an Amen. So I hope there'll be a few people here because this is going to be a follow-up to this message, and it's going to be just absolutely so powerful. We're going to take a detour next week from Matthew, and we're going to look at Romans at a very familiar passage that I am willing to bet you don't fully understand. I bet you think you do, 
but I bet you don't. Here's a little preview. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore now, there, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By a quick show of hands, how many of you have heard that verse before? Yeah, everybody's heard that verse before. And you might be thinking, what? Pastor Jeremy, what does that have to do with the law? Because you think it doesn't have anything to do with the law. It has nothing to do with my freedom. It has nothing to do with the law. But what if I told you it has everything to do with the law? And if you want to know why, you'll have to come back next week because we're going to talk all about it. So let's jump into our key text today, which is Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And it says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is a very deep passage, and it's confusing to to many people. I would be willing to bet, I could be wrong about this, but I would be willing to bet you've never heard very many sermons about this particular passage, maybe references to it. I'm just telling you, in my over 30 years of being in church and listening to sermons, I don't think I've ever in that time ever heard a sermon dedicated to that particular passage of Scripture. References, sure, You know, innuendo, comments and stuff, absolutely. But actually dealing with the text, I don't think I've ever heard it. Maybe you have. Okay, but in one of the easiest ways for a preacher to deal with this, you know what the best way for a preacher to deal with this text is? Is to avoid it. Let's just skip right over that and move on. We don't need to talk about that. Because it, it seems counterintuitive to the popularized version of the gospel where the law is something that's not applicable to us. Okay, so it's, this just muddies the water, so we'll just pass up on that and we'll just leave it alone. But we're not going to avoid it. We're going to learn it. Come on, somebody. So this section is what I would call the unreachable standard. It really is chapter 5, uh, starting where we started in verse 17, going all the way to the end of the chapter in verse 48. The whole section, Jesus is raising the bar not just to a higher morality, but to an unreachable one. And I believe that's really the point here, is that he's saying to them that when you attain the greatest level of righteousness, when you're as righteous as righteous can get, at that moment, you're still not even close. Remember that Jesus is changing expectations here. He started changing the idea of blessing. This is really important because the audience he's speaking to are there for a blessing. That's what has attracted these people, the miracles, the healings, the, 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 just the profound way that he spoke. He, he, he didn't speak the way religious leaders spoke. So they're, they're following him because of the good things he's doing. And as soon as he has their attention, he says, what you think is blessed isn't blessed. And the things you think are terrible are actually a blessing. That's what the whole Beatitudes was. If you missed that, go back to the beginning of the series. All of this is available at flfc.church. So he's changed the idea of what it means to be a blessing. And uh, so Jesus changes the idea of what it means to be blessed, and now he's radically altering the idea of what it means to be righteous. And it is absolutely radical, to say the least. See, we don't think it's radical because it's so much so familiar to us, but this audience was not familiar with this. This would have been absolutely radical teaching when Jesus was giving it. So let's go back to the top of this, and we're going to study it verse by verse. Okay, so uh, chapter 5, verse 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. So what Jesus is doing there is he's setting them up for clarity. You see this? So he's saying, don't think this. So obviously the implication is they were thinking it, and he's saying, no, don't think that. You've got the wrong idea here. Let me give you the correct idea. The people are obviously getting the idea that Jesus is removing the law, most likely because he healed people on the Sabbath. And so 
Uh, and, and, and not only did he heal people on the Sabbath, it was, I mean, it would be really a stretch in my opinion to say it was accidental healing on the Sabbath. Jesus, very del- in my opinion, very deliberately healed on the Sabbath to flaunt the idea and to create conflict with the religious leaders of that day. So according to the religious leaders of that day, Jesus was breaking the law. You and I might be able to debate whether there were any laws were broken, but that's how they felt, and that he declared himself to be God. He was forgiving sins, and they said no one can forgive sins but God. And so the people who were following Jesus were witnesses to this, and they see how Jesus is basically breaking the law and the expectations and flaunting it and arguing with the scribes and Pharisees and teachers of religious law. So it's creating this expectation that there's a new sheriff in town, and we're not playing by the same rules anymore. So Jesus is clarifying this expectation by saying, do not think that I'm here to abolish the law. He has a reputation for being very different than what people recognized as religious authority in that time. So let's go on and read the second half of that verse. So do not think I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. I have come to but to fulfill them. So it's absolutely irrefutable that Jesus is making the statement that I have not come to abolish the law. Now, some people, legalists, uh, will, will use this passage to teach that we are, in fact, still under the law. You see, that's what they would say, you see, Jesus did not come to abolish it. That leads to a huge debate. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a massive debate in modern Christianity. In that it's this question, are we under the law or not? Are we subject to the law? Are we? Or aren't we? Let's keep reading. Verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota... Not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, (laughs) let's be honest. It does sound like Jesus is saying that we're not doing away with the law In fact, what you need to do is a better job of keeping it. Would you agree with me that that's what it sounds like Jesus is saying? Just raise your hand if you're like, yeah, you know, I kind of get that. Okay, let me help you with something because it's not that tricky. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. This is not a trick. So that's exactly what he's saying. So I know some of you are thinking, Pastor Jeremy, are you saying that we are still under the law? Well, what, what I'm saying is that's what Jesus is saying right here. Do you hear me? That is exactly what Je- We don't need a decoder pen. We don't need a fancy way of, of, of scrutinizing the text. And, well, he didn't mean that. Silly. He was joking. Didn't you guys get the joke? That Jesus is actually saying, and you, you've got to catch this because I guarantee you the vast majority of people will not catch this. He's not just saying you need to keep the law. He's saying you're doing a pretty lousy job of keeping the law. You need to keep it at a much higher level than what you're keeping it at. So and you are not just subject to it, but we're subject to every iota and dot. Lots of different translations use different words there uh, for iota and dot. But let me tell you what it means. Iota means the smallest letter. When I was a kid, my mom would use that, you know, not an iota. I had no idea what it meant. Pretty sure she didn't either. But the iota is the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. So the Greek, the Bible, the New Testament was written in Greek, and that word's actually not a translation. That is the Greek word. An iota is the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet, and the dot is from the Greek word, I didn't look up the phonetical pronunciation of this, but I'm going to go with kureia. <laughs> it's from the Greek word kureia, kureia, which means the smallest part of the letter. So I want you to unpack this a little bit. He's saying that the smallest letter, but when that's not fine enough, it's the smallest part of the letter. Are you seeing this? 
He's saying, not only is the law not going to pass away, but the smallest detail of the law is not passing away, and the smallest detail of that detail. Do you see this? He's, he's trying to make it very clear that there's absolutely zero wiggle room. There's not a kind of sort of maybe would you could have, should have. It's not like, well, if you give it a good old college try, that'll do. You know, give it your best. You know, he's saying, no, 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 no. Not only is it not passing away, but the smallest letter and the smallest part of that letter is going to be upheld. Now, Jesus was known for exaggeration for effect. We see that many, many times. This is a good example of it. He's saying that even the smallest letter of the law would be upheld, and not only that, but the smallest part of the letter. This is so huge. So he's saying there's no wiggle room. I mean, he's at, this is what he's done. This is an audience that understood the law in a way you and I never will. And he's saying, not only am I not going to abolish it, but until all is accomplished, even the smallest letter, the smallest part of the letter, I mean, who says that? Even the fine print at the bottom of the sheet on the back of the reverse side that's only, you know, half color. Even that bit, all of it is going to be upheld. It's exactly what he's saying. So now let's go back to the question, because you're all very uncomfortable right now. Are we still under the law? Are we? (laughs) Well, the answer actually depends. You might be. You might be. I mean, as you're sitting here today looking at me, you may very well be under the law. You see, the law represents God's perfect standard of righteousness. To be right before God, we either have to keep the law, the smallest letter of the law, the smallest part of the smallest letter of the law, or we have to find another way. That's it. I mean, if if, if we're going to put our faith, hope, and trust into the law, you better keep it all. And you better keep it right down to the smallest letter, and not only the smallest letter, but the smallest part of the letter. You see what I'm saying? Or you need to find another way. Now, I don't know about you, but if my plan is to keep the smallest part of the smallest letter of the law, I personally am failing miserably. And I sure hope. I really, truly hope there is another option. Because if my salvation, if my right standing before God depends on my ability to keep the smallest part of the smallest letter of the law, I am, in a word, doomed. Do you hear me? So if you're looking for right standing with God through the law, you better get it all right. Because there's no wiggle room. There's no A for effort. There's no participation trophies. If the law is your means to salvation, you have to get it all right. And Jesus, I don't know where that came from. That just, Jesus solidifies, I think I merged those two words in my mind. Jesus solidifies this word with this next line in verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds, listen to this, unless your righteousness, and then what he's talking about is your ability to keep the law, the, the smallest letter, the smallest part of the letter, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh. I mean, he's just absolutely making it clear. We're not getting rid of the law. In fact, we're going to double down. And if you think you're good, you're not good enough. And if you think you've held up a good standard, you, you're looking at these guys, these scribes and Pharisees. These were, the, these were the people that they would have recognized as the example of righteousness on the earth. That's who they looked to. Then nobody could compete with their level of righteousness and holiness. And here Jesus slams down this idea that unless you, you common people, unless you ordinary working folks, unless your righteousness is more righteous than them, 
you're never going to see the kingdom of heaven. So if you're hearing this the way they would have heard this, you would have come to one inescapable conclusion, that this is hopeless. There's no way for me, as one of the people in the audience that Jesus was speaking to would say, oh, okay, I just got to be more righteous than those guys? No problem. It was beyond reach. Now, let me kind of go back a little bit. So what does Jesus mean by the law or the prophets? That's what he opened with. And the reason I want to talk about that is because some people try to split hairs here. This is how some people will try to explain it. And they'll say, well, Jesus is only referring to the moral law, not the Levitical law. In other words, you know, in in defining the moral law, depending on who you're talking to, can be a bit of a uh, subjective scale. Some people say it's the Ten Commandments. Some people say it's the Ten Commandments plus some other things. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's, the moral law is not something that's clearly defined is in terms of opposition to the Levitical law. Now, the Levitical law, maybe you're not, I may be, you know, talking about something you're not super familiar with. But the Levitical law comes with the book of Leviticus. And it, it's basically a very, very long list of Orthodox Jewish customs and beliefs. Now, the, in, in true uh, Jewish religious culture today, that list is far longer than what we see there. But this is where we're going to get stuff like, you know, you can't cut your, can't trim your beard, guys, ladies, all of you ladies with uncovered heads, you're out. Anybody with a tattoo, you're gone. Uh, and anybody cook yesterday? Raise your hand if you cooked food yesterday. Yeah, sorry, you're all going to hell. Uh, too bad. Uh, because you all broke the, you're all breaking the Levitical law. I mean, if you, if you carried, well, probably, I'm guessing nobody carried firewood yesterday unless you were camping. But if you did that, you're bad news for you guys. Um, but if you did any kind of work on the Sabbath, if you, if you prepared food, if you did anything from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, you are a, a big, fat, cotton-headed ninny muggins because you're a lawbreaker. And, and what we have today is we have all these people that have adopted their own version of the law, say, well, I keep this. And I don't worry about that, but their, their basis for deciding which one of those they keep or disregard is purely subjective. It's just they make it up. They've decided based on their own moral code, well, God does and does not care about certain things. But if we're going to go by the word of God, which how many of you agree that should be the authority that with which we answer, then we need to go by the, what the Bible says. Now, this, and this is why the phrase law and the prophets, or, all, or the prophets, is very important because you can't split hairs here. The, the phrase, law or the prophets, actually refers to not just the law, but the writings of the law, the writings of the prophets. What he's saying is he's talking about the entire Old Testament at that point in time. It, it was not just the law. It was the law or the prophets. He was saying all of the writing, all of it, is what he's talking about here. And then I always think, I don't, under really, I don't understand that argument of trying to split hairs about the moral law versus the Levitical law because it doesn't help very much. I don't know anybody that is as guiltless when it comes to exclusively the moral law any more than they would be guiltless when it comes to the Levitical law. I know I sure am not. I have definitely blown it even when it comes to, let's say, the Ten Commandments. I mean, I've, I've told lies before. I haven't killed anyone yet, I think. But I have worked on the Sabbath. I I've, 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 uh, haven't honored the Sabbath before. I've, I mean, so if, if, I'm, if my hope and my, my confidence is based on narrowing it down to just a short list, it doesn't help you. So if you want to split those hairs, go ahead and split them. You're still just as guilty. Okay? So the phrase law of the prophet actually refers to the Old Testament and uh, The more you dig into this, the more you realize what Jesus was saying to them is that the understood path to righteousness was far less attainable than we even think it is. So Jesus will not abolish the law. As long as the law is your path to righteousness or salvation, you are subject to the whole law. So when I asked you, when I said a minute ago, are we under the law or aren't we? I said, well, I don't know. Maybe you are because if that's where your faith is, if you think that you, God approves of you because of what you do and what you don't do, if that's what you think makes you right with God, you have put yourself under the law. 
That's what you're doing. You're, you have moved yourself into this category that says, well, I'm right because of this or not because of that. For you, you're under the law because you're putting your faith into that system. And that system is completely unattainable. So if that's your hope, you better keep it all, Jack. And you better keep it right down to the smallest letter. And Jesus, for effect, is saying, even to the smallest part of the smallest letter. He said, you can't go over it with a 30,000-foot view. If you're going to put your hope in the law, you better go through it with a fine-tooth comb and a filter because you're going to have to keep it all. So Jesus will not do is he will not abolish the law. What Jesus will do, and since you and I are a different audience, see, to the people sitting there on the Sermon on the Mount, it was what Jesus will do. You and I are looking back at what Jesus did do, and what he did do is fulfill the law and the prophets. Oh, man, that is so powerful. When you see this, it just rocks your world. What he did do is he did fulfill them. Now, here's the danger we get into. We read this, and we think that abolish and fulfill mean the same thing, and that one's tied to the other. It absolutely is not the case. Someday the law will be abolished after heaven and earth have passed away. And basically, at the end of the book of Revelation, when we get all the way past the eschatology, the millennial reign of Christ, and all, we have a new heaven and a new earth, and we get to the end of that, then the law will no longer serve its purpose at all. It will be abolished. But right now it's not abolished. It is, however, fulfilled for those whose faith is in Jesus Christ as opposed to whose faith is in the law. Can I get an amen? That's terrible. Let's just do that. Let's just back that up. Jesus has fulfilled the law. Yeah, see, that's so much better. (laughs) I'm just having fun. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. Listen, he fulfills, listen to this, he fulfills the law down to the smallest letter, down to the smallest part of the letter. Oh, that's so cool. So if our hope is in Jesus, we can experience the law fulfilled Wherein through the law, we can only expect the righteous judgment of God. Oh, and you got to catch that because the judgment that so many people have tried to take the judgment out of the Bible. It's a watered down, popularized, you know, false version of the Bible where God, a loving God would never do that. That all the judgment of God is somehow metaphorical. That's not true. It's real. And if our, well, basically any one of any of us that are outside of Jesus, we're subject to that law. Whether we believe it or not, whether we believe in God or not, if you're an atheist, if you're an agnostic, if you're just, you know, into some new age stuff and you, you just don't think it applies to you, we're, all of those people are subject to the law. It does not matter whether we believe it. It doesn't matter. I mean, have you ever seen anybody who denies the law of gravity that, was not subject to it? Of course not. And it's exactly the same here. Those people that believe somehow that God, there's a kinder, gentler version of God that's, that's available to us today, they're just being deceived and lied to. It's the same tactic that, that the devil has used on mankind going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. All he had to do to tempt them is to get them to set, to believe that God didn't mean what he said. That was the tactic. He didn't even try to tempt him with what it was. He just, this is the question he asked. You remember? Did God really say that? Did God really mean that? And now we have an entire culture today with issues like homosexuality, issues about sex outside of marriage, issues about accepting Christ or Muhammad or some other path. And say, well, did God really mean that? It's the exact same tactic that's been used since the beginning of time. The devil is trying to deceive people by making people doubt what God said. So anybody outside of being under the blood and the redemption of Jesus Christ will be subject to the law. Oh, it's so good. So look at, let's go to Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. The law was not abolished 
but it was fulfilled. We are either under the law or we are under Jesus. Oh, that should be very good news for most of us. should be very exciting news for most of us. Because of the other way, it's subject to our righteousness. Look at this phrasing in verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This, I believe anyway, was a bit of a play on words. It's a trick phrase because here's the reality. There's no such thing as your righteousness. It doesn't exist. You're ne- I'm not saying that you can't have better behavior than worse behavior. Sure. Sure, you can misbehave. Right? Can I get an amen? Okay. And if we're not misbehaving, our behavior is more righteous than our bad behavior. Sure, that exists. The problem isn't whether we're behaving good or bad. And it's certainly not the context to say that our behavior doesn't matter. We've already kind of gone down that road a bit. We're going to go down a lot more in the weeks to come. The problem comes is when we believe that our abstaining from our bad behavior now puts us in a category of approval by God. Or our choosing to do really good behavior. Maybe we're giving money to our church, or maybe we're volunteering, and maybe we're helping people in ways we've never helped people before. And all of those things are great. You should do all of those things. But when we start to believe that because we do those things, that we get a gold star from God. That's exactly what he's talking about here. Because unless our righteousness exceeds the teachers of religious law and the scribes and Pharisees, we're out. And let me just help you with something. It's already too late. Your behavior has already not exceeded the righteous standard of the scribes and Pharisees. And in the future, I'm just going to guess, you're probably going to do something in the future that doesn't live up to God's righteous standard. That's just a guess. I don't know you that well, but I know me, and I know I'm, you know, it, I won't get out of this building before I do something wrong. Because righteousness in me doesn't truly exist. Maybe on our standard, but not his. And the only righteousness that I have is based on him. And when my, this is so beautiful, when we realize, oh, I'm not going to cry. When we, I'm trying. (laughs) When we truly grasp the phrase, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because that's your only real path to righteousness. It's when this wretched sin-riddled body ceases to exist and we are raised to new life with Christ Jesus. See, if we believe in our righteousness, that phrase, it's no longer I live, Christ lives in me, we don't even really believe that. We think that we've just added Christ to an already pretty good version of ourselves. It's a self-improvement. We've improved ourselves by adding to, hey, Jesus, you'll make me better. No. When you believe that, what you're doing is you're actually still placing yourself under the old system of righteous works and deeds. You're still subject to the law. But you realize the truth of it is you say that the only real way for me to approach the throne of heaven is for, for this old man to die for this old body to die, for this old way of thinking to die, for these old habits to die, for these old choices to die. And then I can be raised to new life through Jesus. You see, there's no such thing as your righteousness. 
And therein lies the point. As long as you are the source of your righteousness, your only hope is in keeping the letter of the law, which is hopeless. You can't do it. Currently, the law has not been abolished, but will be abolished when there's a new heaven and a new earth and all is accomplished. But currently, the law is fulfilled in Jesus. This is so good. Let me give you just one other little piece of scripture here to help you understand that I didn't just make this up. This is some harebrained idea from Pastor Jeremy. Galatians chapter 3, verse 24 says, So then the law was, what's was? Let me know what was is. It's a phrase of past tense, right? Okay, so the law was our guardian until what? Until means that. It means there was a change. Until Christ came. If you don't know this, Christ is a reference to Jesus. In order that we might be justified by faith, not justified by the law, not justified by the guardian, but justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now, really, I'm I'm right in the middle of this message. And that's why I'll, I'll hope if you... I just hope you'll come back next week and hear the rest of this. Because we're going to talk about a false dichotomy that exists in uh, a lot of this dialogue today. You know what a false dichotomy is? A dichotomy is two opposing things, one cancels out the other. Like, I'm standing, so therefore I'm not sitting, right? It's a dichotomy. I can't be standing and sitting. But a lot of people create this false dichotomy. They say, well, if you throw out the law... You're just making it a free-for-all for for sin. So it's either one or the other. So it's either the law defines our moral behavior, and if we take that out, well, then, oh, well, I guess it's okay to do whatever we want to do. That is a false dichotomy. Saying that we're not subject to the law or that the law is fulfilled in Jesus does not mean that it's a free-for-all on our behavior. We can just do whatever we want to do. Although many people absolutely believe that that's what that means. If you want to know why it doesn't mean that, you need to be here next Sunday because I'm going to tell you all about it. Jesus fulfilled all that the prophet said of him. There's a word that I'm sure many of us don't know. It's called Christophanies. It's pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament. And they're everywhere because the entire Old Testament points to Jesus. And Jesus fulfilled them all. And, he, and by his death, he fulfilled the just requirements of the law. The punishment for our failure to keep the smallest letter and the smallest part of the letter is death. And the only reason you and I escape it is because Jesus, who did not sin, who never did violate the law, he died in our place. He fulfilled the just requirement of the law. 